we can start off like that. <laughs> Might as well start off. So uh, it's actually something that I wanted to do for a long time and uh, just couldn't find the right dance partner. So I guess this is going to be our first uh, episode of podcast, which we haven't picked the name for just yet. <laughs> Any ideas for that? <laughs> Low Brass Podcast number one would do fine. <laughs> How about the uh, Master and the Apprentice? Well, you be... Sounds pretty good. Well, I'll be the master. I'm going to say, which is which? Yeah, <laughs> that would be funny. Because I still feel I'm learning a lot. There's different things, so... I think uh, I'm still an apprentice, but... No, that should be that should be fun. So <laughs> it's funny because I wanted to do um, some sort of a podcast, and the problem is whenever I find somebody who's a peer, they have usually a very different interest than I do. <laughs> if I find somebody who has the same interest, they're usually not exactly into doing podcasts or not very um, talkative or um, very. Um, I'm not going to use the word social. social. Well, I think I can talk for Scotland if you can talk for Lithuania. So for those uh, who don't know, and I'm sure most of you know, this is uh, famous um, James Gourlay, the pride of Scotland, the face of music entertainment in Pittsburgh. So my name is Algirdas Matonis, and um, we have a very interesting little duo here because we both play at River City. Well, you conduct at the River City. So James is the arts director of the River City Brass Band and I'm uh, the principal euphonium and James is also a good friend of mine and um, also a colleague at the Duquesne University as yeah. of uh, January 2018. That's that right, we joined, the, we joined the faculty on the same day, I think it's the 10th of January. So that's pretty cool, you excited about that? Yeah, I think it's really nice, I was in higher education for a long time as everybody knows, taught at uh, Royal Northern College of Music for a few years. You were the head of brass there. Huh? Actually, I was the head of the wind brass and percussion there. Okay. And then at the Royal Scottish Academy, now called the Scottish Conservatoire, uh, I was the head of the whole school of music. Why did they change the title for that thing? Oh, I think, I think uh, <laughs> Conservatoire <laughs> sounds a bit posher. I think that's... Uh, it sounds, it's, for me, it sounds... No, it sounds bummer for me. <laughs> Academy sounds a little bit more prestige to me. Yeah. Rather than college, I don't know. I don't know why they changed the name particularly, but uh, <laughs> anyway, they did, and uh, so <laughs> you uh, left. <laughs> and I left. Yeah, I left to do various things: play in orchestras, uh, conduct, yeah, play solos. And it was nice, but uh, I haven't actually taught in an institution full time for oh a good ten years now, and so it's quite nice to come back and be able to share the knowledge that I have, what I have, I'm happy to share. Yeah. Are you going to be doing some connecting there as well? Yes, uh, we're talking about uh, doing a brass ensemble and we're hoping to expand brass that out to be a brass band. band. Yes. Uh, and in fact, there's a proposal that we would amalgamate our River City Youth Brass Band with at least the first years, the freshman years yes. of the UK students, and then we'd immediately have a brass band. We wouldn't have Full any yeah. any time to build it up. We wouldn't need that time because it would be right. That back. would open up spaces for more students as well in UK. It would be a great recruitment tool for UK because they would have high school age. Yeah, musical students right there on the doorstep coming into Duquesne this yeah. would be the idea that we would rehearse at Duquesne and then uh, you know it could be a really fruitful collaboration a partnership that would be really beautiful yeah that's 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 an idea I would be down for uh, you seem to be quite aware of brass band culture both from England and inside US you, you've been doing quite a lot of traveling outside River City and conducting uh, brass bands in USA outside River City haven't you yeah, I conduct all over the world now, and uh, uh, I have regular engagements with the Brass Band Très Etoile in Switzerland, and also with the Foden's Brass Band in England, and uh, I'm a, a, a professor, a visiting professor at the Royal Northern College of Music, where I conduct this college brass band two oh, yes. or three times a year, and that's a very fine group. But apart from that, I go to Russia, I'm going to... Bangladesh, I'm going to China, I'm doing all kinds of things. When have you been to Bangladesh? I've never heard I know it's, it's going, it's coming. Are you uh, going to Bangladesh? Next, uh, next uh, February, there's about six brass from River City going, right. and also some uh, people, jazz musicians, 
principally from around the United States. How long is the flight to Bangladesh? I think it's about 18 or 19 hours. So seems, there you go. seems fair. fair. Yeah, it's a long, <laughs> long way. Yeah, I saw you've been busy with uh, the school stuff. Are you still rehearsing with those um, school bands for the concerts? Yeah, well, right now, as you know, because you're involved in it, we're, we have a series of Celtic concerts, which we have every March with uh, the River City Brass Band. And it's a joy for me because I get to play music from my homeland. Makes me feel a bit ho- <laughs> yeah, it makes me feel a little bit homesick at times, a little bit... Uh, Teary, let's say that, because I, I think my family back in Scotland when we're playing that music. But one of the features, of course, is that we get to play with school bands around the area and some community bands. So that's been my job to go out in the morning, seven o'clock in the morning, usually. Rehearse, rehearse with them. Rehearse with them, so that I know what they're going to be like when they come in. And uh, it's been really successful, as you saw. We had uh, mm-hmm. pretty full houses all the way around. Killed with really CDs. Nice. You, yeah. you, you killed with those CDs. <laughs> Well, is that the? Is that's definitely the best sales uh, in terms of CD since I've arrived. I've never heard of. Uh, did we ever sell out since my arrival? Like the the full stock? Did we ever sell out in one concert? No. Well, we never. We've we've never had um, an opportunity to sell a single CD at a concert. Oh, you usually. Were selling, uh-huh. Usually we sell four or five. Okay. This is a brand new one. It's called Celtic Connections. And the audience have been asking for this CD for two or three years. So we sold a hundred in one concert, eight in another concert. We had a limited pressing this time of about five, six hundred, but it looks like we'll sell out in a week. Yeah. So that's fantastic for us. You got those from, um, can you tell a little bit more about that Celtic Connection? Because it's not only a uh, recent CD, those, those, this is by the way a live CD for those who don't know. And for those who don't know, because some of you might not. So what we've been recently doing is um, we, we've been having a cycle which is called Celtic Connection. And this is uh, a little bit of a different of a cycle because it's joined by back Backpipes and I, when I say backpipes, I mean like twenty deep. How how many how many players like percussion and backpipes? Well, there are about ten drummers and uh, twelve to fifteen bagpipers that work with us. And we've been doing this collaboration with the, the pipes and drums of Carnegie Mellon oh, University yeah. for about four years. I think this is the fourth year. Oh, okay, so it's not and, that. It's pretty uh, recent. It's quite recent, yeah. and we've been each year adding new arrangements new repertoire so that the pipes and drums can play with the brass band and uh, it is a pretty awesome sound, it's pretty awesome. But the, the CD is uh, back in, what, when's the latest, because all the recordings are live, they, they are live, none of them are edited, it's raw, raw recordings and when's the latest recording, because I know you've been picking up, mm. uh, re-listening to recordings from multiple cycles, so what what's the title of the latest recording and when, when was it? Do you know the date by any chance? Yeah, well, we to make this CD, we recorded nine separate concerts um, with roughly the same pieces, and so that meant that we could choose from nine uh, separate instances of a single piece to find the best one. I didn't want to do ed- any editing because I sometimes think that editing a CD takes away the energy of it, it yeah. becomes a dead thing. And uh, the performances on this particular CD come from a range of concerts that we did in 2016 in March and 2017 in March. Okay. But the bulk of the, the, the recordings that I selected yeah. came from a single concert and that was at Greens, the Palace Theatre at Greensburg in 2017, it'd be March the 8th, something okay. like that. Now, when I listened to the, that concert, I realized that it was one of those concerts that was just fantastic. Okay. And uh, so I used that as the basis uh, to choose most of the pieces from that. And it's called Celtic Connections because we connect Scottish and Irish music to Kentucky bluegrass and country and western. Yeah. We do that through the, the idea is that the the Scottish fiddlers, when they came to America, the Irish fiddlers... Well, Scottish being in Pittsburgh is a big thing, isn't it's it? It's a huge thing. It's but, like no one... but when the first wave of immigrants came, they brought their fiddles, they brought their music, and then they went into Appalachia, they went into the West, mm-hmm. and that music morphed into what we now call country and western. So it's a great... 
it's a great synergy between the two types of music, and on the CD it sounds fantastic. It's uh, it's funny, bagpipes fit very well, uh, the brass band, at least in my opinion, from my experience. It's one thing I'm really glad I'm sticking, sitting in the back row. Is, um, most people, I don't think most people realize what it's like when you're having 30 brass players in your face, and then 20, like 10 oh. additional percussion players, and 10 bagpipes or whatever, back in your ear, and that's... Uh, that <laughs> <laughs> it, it is extremely loud. I notice the bagpipers themselves all wear earplugs. They're all, yeah, not just uh, regular earplugs. They actually have the fancy ones. Yeah, they have to have the special ones because the, the bagpipe really is an instrument of war. It's supposed, so to, be, loud, it's wow. supposed to be on the battlefield and yeah. scare the enemy. And, uh, well, it certainly it quite didn't work out. It didn't work out very well, did it? Not always, no. <laughs> not, not always. always. <laughs> yeah. That's but, uh, yeah, but it's a beautiful show, that the, the Celtic Connections, and uh, it's just a, a, an indication of the flexibility of the River City Brass Band, the range of music that we were able to play, the range of uh, uh, different genres that we play quite easily. I think that's pretty impressive. You have a favorite piece from the program? Oh, from the Celtic program? Yeah. Well, I like two of them. Um, one is the, our arrangement of, uh, of Amazing Grace, which is a simple arrangement, but uh, it seems to touch the heart of the audience. They seem to go crazy for that. And then the other one is the is the time to say goodbye. That's the Andrea Bocelli uh, song, oh, which yeah. is uh, because the bagpipes only really play in one key. We the band starts in quite a remote key, and there's and a quick modulates. modulation. Yeah. And when the bagpipes come in at that modulation point, I think it's just electric. That yeah. Yeah. I had a chance to play Amazing Grace today. <laughs> Not the best occasion, though. I had um, there was uh, there was one of the gentlemen from the Lithuanian community passing away. And oh, yeah, sorry. To, but uh, as soon as I started playing, the snow started falling. I picked the most comfortable. I figured it's going to be um, pretty cold outside and there a little bit late, so I figured I'm going to set up a stand in advance because of the wind <laughs> and clip it up. And I picked a, a very comfy range. I, I got it. It was like E minor or something like that. And as soon as I touched the face and I played... The first idea was, I'm not going to make it through. <laughs> I'm not going to make it through. Because as soon as I put the mouthpiece on my face, it felt terrible. Have any experience playing outside? Yeah, a lot of it. Uh, I'm from Scotland. Yeah, I have a lot of experience playing outside. It's one of my uh, favorite things. I actually sometimes go and practice outside. In the cold? In the cold, in the hot. It doesn't really matter. Because if you're playing outside, there's no feedback from walls, of course, because of the run run. Yeah. So you start to project the sound really quite well and um, one thing I, I really like to do is to play the alpine horn out of doors and uh, that's a sound that you can make really carry. When you come back then to your, let's say your real instrument, the sound just goes crazy, it just goes huge. So what, what's an alpine horn? Most people don't even know what's an alpine horn. Well, I if, certainly didn't know until you showed me. Well, if people have seen the Ricola advertisement, <laughs> then that's the instrument the gentleman plays on that. But everybody in Central Europe, from Switzerland, the Alps, Southern Germany, they'll know what that is. Austria has played there. That, that thing is expensive, isn't it? Where did you get yours? Mine was specially made for me, so it was quite expensive. Um, because I wanted to have a, a wider bore than the normal one, so it's a bit more feels a bit more like a tuba to, to play, and also it has special design on there. It has the blue bells of Scotland painted on, and also mm -hmm. also Edelweiss. So it has the Edelweiss and the Scot Scottish symbol together, which is rather beautiful. Yeah, it cost me a lot of money uh, many years ago. It cost me a month's salary. Oh, and, uh, Sounds like a, an interesting choice of investment, <laughs> playing an alpine horn. Well, it's if There's you... not that many alpine horn gigs around. Well, I, got, I did get a gig with, with the Pittsburgh Symphony playing with the alpine, alpine horn. With the alpine horn. Uh, when did that? Was it the recent one? Was it yes, that? it was about, oh, I want to say three, four months ago. Was that the one where you played alpine horn? Yeah, I played alpine horn with the, with the Pittsburgh Symphony. They had a... Was it, what was the piece? Oh, that's a funny story. The, um, <laughs> the, the, the Pittsburgh Symphony wanted to know what I was going to play, and I said, I'll, I'll play something solo so they don't have to have a, an arrangement. I'll just go in the front of the orchestra and play the piece. It was for a children's concert. Oh, okay. And um, 
They said they asked what uh, what piece what the piece would might be, and I said it was the Wilfred Z Mozart Concertino for Alpine Horn, <laughs> and uh, they announced it like that. <laughs> That I was going to play the Wilfred Z Mozart uh, concertino, which is nice. Is it actually? Uh, no, there's no Wilfred Z Mozart. <laughs> and then, uh, so the the Alpine one has an oral tradition. It's not really much written down, so you have to learn things by heart or just improvise. So I improvised um, uh, a Lendler, which is a kind of Alpine Austrian dance. And uh, it was film. somebody filmed it and put it up on YouTube, and I had many people writing to me, Alpine horn players, asking, <laughs> asking, asking me for the sheet music. <laughs> that's hilarious. But I just made it up as I went along. That's that's. that's and of course, it, it was a children's concert demonstrating music from around the world, and so they wanted to demonstrate the fact that Brahms, Johannes Brahms, had gone into the Alps and had heard the Alpine horn being played, yeah. and he incorporated it into his third symphony, that <laughs> Is it pitched? Or are you like... Uh, of course it's pitched. Of course it's pitched. Yeah. No, 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 no. That's what I'm saying, like, how do you pitch it? Is it almost like open on um, on brass instrument, like open? Yeah, it's, it's just one length of tube. They're usually in G flat, and that means they they you go up to the top G flat, then you have the scale of the harmonic okay. series. So it's the harmonic series basically. Okay. So you have to be in the top end of the instrument, like a natural horn, to be able to get a scale. Okay. And so the idea of that concert was that the horn player should play, or I would play that Brahms horn thing on the Alpine horn, which Brahms had heard. Then the horn player would play it <laughs> straight away afterwards. I thought it was a nice nice demonstration actually it was really nice I, I've only seen you play once uh, I believe we did uh, one of those uh, two of us I think um, that lady uh, Suzanne was playing with us that was in 2014 when I first oh, yeah. first came to Pittsburgh so. yeah well we are uh, in my kids concerts when we do brass quintet concerts and you'll probably do some of those eventually and we do children's demonstration I usually bring out the Alpine, Alpine one and uh, it's quite useful to show um the, the length of a of a typical brass instrument because yeah, it's straight but it's yeah. quite it's yeah. absolutely straight so is that the actual length of uh, of the tuba no well actually it's uh, the tuba would be a bit longer so the G flat horn is um, is a little bit higher than the the F horn so if you take the French horn okay. French horn is about 12 feet so this is about 11 and a half feet how long is the tuba well, it depends if it's an E flat or a B flat, but for the E flat one is about 15 feet. How long is euphonium? 14? Though? Euphonium is only 8 feet long. Shorter than the French one? Yeah, well, the, the French one is oh, F thin, lower. It's thin, yeah. Oh, I'm not making sense. It's so F now lower. I now I got it. Mm. Okay. <laughs> the, the, the proper French horn in F is is lower than euphonium, it's longer. You've been bringing all kinds of gadgets to the U-Brass band. Yeah, well, as you know, we've just started uh, a new uh, education program. Is it, is it new? It's just a new location, but you've been you you've been doing that for a long time, haven't you? It's not exactly like a new concept. Well, it is actually a new concept because although we had a, a Saturday music education program for three four years uh, in partnership with the Pittsburgh Public Schools. What we wanted to do was to come to reshape it. So we have three levels now, which we really didn't have. And one is what we call mini kids. Those are kindergarten through to grade four or five, school grade four in America. So these are you know, five until nine year olds. Yeah. And they, they can they can be absolute beginners, and we've started two or three. And what's quite new with that is that we've started uh, last week. We started two young boys playing the cornet, and their mum playing the cornet, so that the mother can go and practice with them. And that was at the nine o'clock session. That was we, it the same lady who brought same those lady, kids? Yeah, she same. plays cornet? No, now she does. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> now she That's does. hilarious. <clears throat> now she does. And then, then we have the junior brass ensemble, which is from nine until about 13 or 14, eventually. We never had that formal structure. 
And so it's in its infancy, but what I want to do with those two groups is to follow the associated board of the Royal Schools of Music curriculum. So they will do those grades, both as practical instrumentalists, but also the theory and the, above all, the ear training. So we'll build in a part of music education that the kids often don't get in the schools now. Will they get any, uh, are we going to be handing out any certificates or? Yes, absolutely. Oh. They'll do an examination, they'll oh, get a okay. diploma. Okay. They, and that, as the Associated Board uh, syllabus goes from beginner right up to professional level oh, yeah. uh, in a very structured way. And uh, nobody, nobody's working to that syllabus okay. uh, in Western Pennsylvania that I know of. And if we were to adopt it, it would be quite innovative for the area and also really great for the students, fantastic for the students. One of those kids was amazing, that little... Michael. The one, did you? Did I tell you the story what happened? Yes. Like the first week he came in, I, I was teaching him to, how to shut lips to make buzz, mm -hmm. how to buzz a noise, and then he had a very good sound straight away. Mm -hmm. And the next week he came in and played the car thing. He's a, he's a very shy boy. It's, he's, I don't know whether he's shy, he's quiet, which is a, quite a contrast in comparison to, to the other boys. Yeah. I, I like it. It's, he's it's yeah, he's very, very shy. His mother tells me he's super shy. But, you know, that could be a way for him to come out of himself if he finds that he's got the... He's certainly got the, the desire to get better, and this is somebody who's 10 years old, and in a week his improvement has been fantastic. So the, I'm quite proud of the, what we're trying to, what we're achieving out in Penn Hills early days, but I could see it growing into something incredible. So you could see then, if we have mini kids, we have kids, then we have a youth brass band, and that youth brass band extends from age 15 into about age 19 or 20 using students from Duquesne University. That third level would, would be, be a rather yeah, elite level. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, that could be a really excellent concertizing uh, ensemble that we could send out to those engagements that River City can't do or River City for which River City is too expensive. Okay. <clears throat> so it could be a really halfway house yeah. there. Yeah, so so the the youth brass band we have uh, the younger kids who are kinda of doing like a small brass ensemble and the older, more advanced kids do the youth brass band, which they actually play the original or at least most of the program is original brass band music. So uh, what, what's the youngest? What's the age group for the brass band? What, what's the youngest and the oldest? Uh, you mean in the youth brass yeah, band? Yeah, the actual youth brass band. Well, we, we normally started at grade 7 or 8, so mm -hmm. that's 12, 13 oh. upwards. Okay. And, uh, uh, but it really depends on standards, because if I find Somebody's a fifth grader who's incredibly talented, then we're not going to hold them back. Yeah. We'll put them into the, yeah, in the, the youth brass band. And play a third corner or something. Like whatever. I mean, anybody who's been brought up in the British brass band uh, tradition knows that you throw people in the deep end and, uh, and they usually swim. My teacher, William Ross, put me in the band. Uh, our village band after one lesson okay. and he said if you see a note that you recognize and can play, play it, play it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I mean in that first rehearsal I maybe saw that note come up because it was a C <laughs> came up a lot <laughs> and then you know he taught me a D and he taught me an E and then that would be uh, really nasty if they made you play some sort of key with no C naturals <laughs> yeah there aren't many of those in the brass band. No, no, many, you many like four different keys or something like that. But you were, you were, in, were you originally brought up as a brass band person? Because you, you, you were kind of, you built your career as an orchestral musician. Then you were never a brass band musician. You were a conductor. You were not. As far as uh, am I being correct on this? Not really. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not really. <laughs> uh, well, I started to play in the brass band when I was nine or ten. Okay. And. Uh, when I was 15, I left the brass band scene uh, to go to the Royal College of Music in London. And uh, that's when I kind of had a, if you like, a big gap from playing or having anything to do with brass bands. Mainly because I was trying to concentrate on becoming an orchestral player. And, uh, and, <laughs> and I got a job um, in the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra when I was 18. That's early. So, 
it paid off having that break from the brass bands. I was able to develop something else. But I quickly went back to it. I played with uh, the, uh, then it was called the Birmingham School of Music Brass Band. They had a good brass band. And then after a while, I got into conducting. I think by my early 20s, I was already conducting brass bands. But always as a kind of hobby, as a side thing, because I was earning my living as an orchestral player and playing solos and doing Philip Jones brass ensemble and doing film music. And occasionally I would go and do some brass band. And it's only in the last, um, I say, 20, 25 years that the brass band work has taken the main focus of what I do. It's not the only thing I do. I still conduct orchestras from time to time, win band, do a lot of that. Um, whatever anybody wants me to pay, I, somebody pays me to conduct, I'll conduct them. And, uh, and that's really good because it means that I get access to a wide, wide range of music. I was uh, curious, to, is there a, is it standard that uh, the Brassman, because you're an art director, but you conduct, is it arts director and a conductor or just arts director and the conducting falls into that. So how does normally, because this is how it works at the River City, does it work the same in, in UK that conductors uh, fall into kind of promoting and managing the money or is it normally a separate person or is it a combination of both? Um, I, think, I think my job is actually unique in the world and I don't know of another one like it. See, if uh, the conducting part of what I do is uh, is actually small a small, a small yes. chunk because the artistic direction part is a big chunk because I have to plan the programming. Yes. I have to do uh, a lot of the arranging. I have to, if we have them, book the guest artists if we have them. And then there's a the third part of my job, which is general director. And that means I'm the chief executive of the River City Brass Company. So there are three parts of my job at River City Brass, and conducting is one of them, and that's great. Uh, but the, the other two are actually, in a way, more important, because although the other two parts allow me to work, they also allow 28 other people, actually 34 other people, to work, because without really good programming, then we don't sell tickets. Yeah. If we don't sell tickets, then we don't make a profit, and then all kinds of bad things happen. But uh, that's kind of the case with most of the professional musicians. That's that's a big problem, which um, I I kind of didn't understand when I was growing up and trying to start becoming a professional musician. That eventually, if you want to become a professional, playing ends up being just a small chunk of what you end up mm -hmm. doing. And if you're not, that's why you get some amazing amateur players. So most people, when you say amateur, they think poor level of playing skills, and that has nothing to do with it. Just meaning that you earn your living from exactly that thing. Right. And that's, that's an interesting thing, because some players are very capable of displaying skills on the instrument, but all the other aspects are not so great, and that's where um, big trouble happens, because they cannot, either they don't want to do certain promotional related work or other stuff and that's that's a big issue and um, oftentimes uh, especially something that's uh, common um, even with university students that whenever you ask them where their career goes kind of and that's something if you asked me like six seven years ago what do you want to do is be a soloist and how are you going to do that just practice very hard <laughs> Yeah, well, that's, so that's a part. That's a, part th that's of a good. That's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> but that's something you you should probably be um, be building up before you even. That's that's the downside of being a musician. You should be there more or less before you actually come into the university. You should have like, established a, a very decent portfolio or like skills at mm. least in terms of. Well, um, there are there are late developers. I mean, and I've met many of them. Christian Lindbergh. And um, <laughs> I can think of a young man who you don't know who's at the RNCM. He's called Adrian Spillett. Adrian, if you ever hear this, um, this is a good story about you. He, Adrian Spillett was uh, rejected at, at audition from the RNCM and then given a reserve place. And eventually that reserve place was converted reluctantly into a full place. And he worked so hard. And he became the first percussion soloist oh, percussion. To, to win the BBC Young Musician of the Year competition. It was oh. a major, major achievement. And now he's a, uh, 
you know, he's an international soloist, he's gigging everywhere. And that was somebody that had started late and needed a little bit of a run up, but more than caught up and then overtook some some people. So you can't write I, you can't write people off. You can only um, encourage them to get out there and market themselves. Yeah. Try and find something that they can do that nobody else can, maybe. And uh, you know, be creative and, and above all, be persistent. Because you know, if you give up too early because you get a knockdown, then you know you never achieve anything. You've got to be persistent. You've got to keep at it. That's that's one of the things um, I kind of find the the key to success is just having um, failure is usually a big part of what I normally do, and that's uh, you fail hundred times before you kind of stop failing. And even when you stop failing, you're still kind of failing in a minor way all the time. Maybe you're not even when you perform great or you do something great, it's never good enough. Well, no, nothing's ever perfect, and the, 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 yeah. that's what keeps us going, isn't it? Yeah. We want to be perfect. It's reaching out to that thing that we can never achieve, but in in reaching out, we improve ourselves. I still feel that I'm getting better as a player after 52 years of playing the instrument. But you've been playing, you play consistently. A, a lot of people, whenever, that's another thing I've noticed, uh, and I know a bunch of, uh, I have a bunch of colleagues I work with who are professional established musicians, and whenever they have an off days or, you know, they're rather in name, they're not in cycle, they would take off two or three weeks. I don't think I took more than a week off of playing since I started playing at seven years old. I kind of remember last, I know once I, I flew outside, my parents encouraged me to fly on a trip with a school or whatever, and I had to take, I believe, 10 days off, and I didn't want to go. All the school kids were going because it was sponsored, and I told my parents I'm not going, so they forced me to go. And uh, I remember I was pissed off at them, because when I came back, I didn't feel right, and I was like, I'm done, I will never be a musician. <laughs> I know, I know, but back then I, I, I wasn't Actually, well, uh, well, sometimes I have to take several weeks off because... Oh, you do take a couple weeks? Yeah, I sometimes have to because if I'm conducting and the, and the conducting schedule is really tough and there's just no time. I mean, I could make time. But if I'm focusing on one job, then it's hard to break that focus for something else. So, yeah, but I have a very good way of getting back into shape pretty quickly. And... And knowing that it's going to, yeah. through experience, I know that's going to work. But I generally um, carry generally, that tube tube with you. Yeah, I have a practice tube which I can take. A lot of people have been asking about that thing. Um, is it the Wessex, uh, the small miniature? Yeah, this one. Maybe they have uh, like two or three different mm. miniature ones. Which one is that? Mine's an, uh, mine's an F travel tuba. Yeah. Five valves, gold bras. They, I, I've, I've been to the DC Army Band Conference last year. They had a mini phoneme and I, I thought it was pretty bad. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I thought I'd, I'd rather carry a baritone horn, like a small <laughs> bridge baritone horn. It's the same in size. And you could, if you're traveling via plane, you can still put it overhand. Whereas uh, that euphonium is tiny bit smaller, but it plays so bad. Well, I mean, it's expected. It's not going to sound and play. But it sounded almost like a, felt like a mouthpiece almost. They're very ambitious and very weird. And also rotary stuff. Oh, yeah. It's just, you play rotary because you're a tuba player. But for me, it's, I don't know, it's just... The, I have a rotary euphonium. You got ro oh, you got that yeah. German, uh, Russian, yeah, uh, Russian rotary baron. euphonium. But I've had several rotary euphoniums in my lifetime. I started on one. Yeah, I mean, but this, the ones I had were were straight. They weren't um, they weren't bent like that, and uh, they worked really well. One was an Alexander uh, from Mainz, and yeah, that was the best one, I guess. Uh, well, you know, rotary valve, piston valve. That's a very good. I don't like rotary at all. That thing felt so weird. My 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 meaty because I've got these kind of porky it's, fingers. It's just a very different. And also the, the instruments are very different. The sounds are different. And um, I guess within like anything, it's a matter of taste. So I currently have uh, I think a four, three rotary tubas. Yeah, got I've got two front action piston valves. And um, what's, your, what's your preference? The top. 
pistons or okay, it, it really depends on the shape of the valve block because if it if the fourth valve is fits under the finger nicely, then that's okay. But if it's if it's not not comfortable on the fourth valve, uh, then you have a problem because you know you're you're using your fourth and third together. That's not that's not easy. Yeah. I have a problem with because the microphone is the fourth one is on the side, but even then, big problem because uh, if I was to hold it properly in a comfortable position with shoulders, only the tip of my my finger uh -huh. So whenever I need to use, I need to do this mm -hmm. in order not to mm -hmm. like get sloppy and get the valve stuck. So even that is not ideally comfortable. No. For me. Sometimes when I play fast, I use the trumpet combinations like uh, my one and three four. Yeah, me too. Why not? Yeah, watch for the trumpet. I don't know. It's just, uh, it seems like a waste of a uh, waste of a tube. <laughs> yeah. Because I've been I've been asked so many times why do you? Because I use so many alternative combinations for brass band, different combinations for piano. When I play with piano, and uh, people have been asking why do you? Use well, because we usually sound very sharp to the piano, particularly E four notes. I. I that's a big problem for me because even when I'm fully out, I, I tend to be on a flatter side on the, um, in the brass band, and I used to think it's uh, something to do with the instrument. But I've changed two instruments, and I'm, I'm still, if I'm fully in, I'm usually fine. But most people are usually, that's the thing, they're pulling out. I'm, I'm figuring out whether it's something to do with my playing or just keep on picking the instruments, which are, but you know what, with the piano, I, I am sharp, so I do need to play with the piano. But. Yeah, most of us are. The European instruments are tuned to. A is four four two hertz mm -hmm. rather than four four zero hertz. That makes a tremendous difference. But Dingfelder, whenever he plays, he pulls it out like a yeah. good one and a half. Inch. Everybody blows differently. Yeah, that's weird. everybody blows differently. I mean, I know I lift the pitch a lot. But you get sharper. Yeah, I, I lift I lift the pitch a lot. Okay. And uh, so my slides are out that much. I only take out my first uh, slide normally. They're all out a lot. Yeah. Or if I play the B flat tuba, I've got a big B flat rotary tuba, and my hands on the first slide anyway, so I can I can adjust it quite easily. Is, it, is, it, is there a massive uh, difference in tendencies in terms of the uh, rotary and pistons, or uh, it's more of the same? Sharp in that ensemble, flat in that ensemble, sharp with piano, flat with this or that, or is it uh, very different? Because you find in several notes, like certain certain notes are most of the time sharp, like your above the staff, E flat, yeah, uh, those are... It's the, it's, the same, it's the same relationship through all the instruments, so that E flat that you're talking about on the C tuba becomes an F and it's the same problem. But that's, that's, it doesn't seem like a big problem with trumpet, well, I guess so, but trumpets have different combinations which are sharp. Trumpets and cornets. We all we all have notes on our instruments which are out of tune. I think the great thing is to know which ones they are and and when they're coming up, spot them and uh, and change them. Just you know, make sure they make sure you're always playing in tune. I mean, I use when I'm practicing, I use that TE Tuner app. Oh, you you actually do look at the tuner? Yeah, yeah. I use the use the tuner. App. That TE Tuner has also got the energies. It has a, a color, has a spectrograph inside, mm. so uh, I can I can use that. I can use it as a very good teaching tool as well because if somebody's playing and uh, and they can see that their sound is say a different color from mine or from yours, mm. they then can make the facial changes to to try and get that color. And I think that's quite useful. You see, the reason I, I'm not a huge fan of the tuners is because I just me personally I find that. Um, Whatever, what I'm looking for and what I'm listening to is usually the, the um, intervals, yeah. whether they're in tune. If the whole thing is a little bit sharp, like, it doesn't matter for me, because later on when you play with a player, it goes, it varies so much. I find it completely useless as long as I'm listening to the intervals. That's, sure. That's what I'm normally, and that thing sometimes makes me more confused than, and it helps me. Uh, do, you use, do you use Dr. Drone, the app? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dr. Drone is very useful. Okay. Yeah, it really is useful. Uh, because what it does is uh, it, so it, it, play, it, for a it, it plays a drone. It plays a long, sustained tone. 
perfectly in tune. Oh, and it's like and, a... and then you play an interval against that, oh, okay. and it tells you whether the interval is good or not. Oh, okay. Uh, of course, that's equal temperament intervals. But just the same as for for a student learning, you know, training their ear and training what it feels like to be more or less in tune is quite useful. Uh, in in the olden days, a long time ago, uh, I used to uh, have three separate recording machines. So what I would do, they were cassettes. So what I would do, I would, I would record a very long note, as long as I could play, uh, quietly, uh, with a tuning machine, say a B flat. Okay. And then I would play that tape back and, record and play an F above and record that interval. Like overdubbing. That's, it's exactly overdubbing. It's a exactly. little bit old school, I don't think. And, and, then, <laughs> and then with a third machine, put in a third in the top. So mm -hmm. now I've got an A in there. And then, so I can hear that chord and see if I make mm -hmm. that chord in tune. So it's a bit like multi-tracking, yeah. but ancient. How would you how would you play those bands? Just click click click. No, yeah, you have to put them in. You have to put them into. So you got the second machine has got two notes on on one tape. You put it into a player. You play that, and you record that with you playing against it. But how would you be able to record in the cassette and then over record? No, you don't know. You don't overdub it. You record on a separate machine. I'm, st I'm still not exactly what you. So okay. you've got the like, you've got a cassette, yeah. You've got machine one. Okay. And you record B flat. Okay. Then you take the tape out. You have a cassette, the little. Yeah, you take the cassette out and you put it into a player, cassette player okay. with speakers and amp, and you press play, and on a separate oh, machine. Oh, it records both the. Okay, got it. Yeah. So, so you need three cassettes. You need for three that. cassettes. <laughs> <laughs> you need three three cassette recording machines. Okay, yeah. I got it now. And, uh, <laughs> it seems a little bit overcomplicated uh, way of recording. Uh, well, there was no, there was yeah, no technology there. I understand. Yeah. In 1975, that's how you did it. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny. And uh, and by the way, the the tuning machine was a thing this big. <laughs> In 1975, it was, a, a was it expensive? How, how oh yeah, pretty expensive. Okay. Yeah. What's a pretty expensive? Well, I was about a week's salary. A week's salary. I was thinking in terms of salary, it was quite expensive. <laughs> That's pretty expensive. And uh, <clears throat> also, I work often with a decibel meter. To for for what? Like right, measure, so you measure how loud you can think. How what? loudly and how softly. Oh, okay. Because you see, if you work with a decibel meter, you can see the size of your dynamic range. Oh yeah, that so people, makes sense. People talk about dynamic range, but they don't actually know what they're talking about. And decibels, yeah. But a decibel meter actually measures it. So yeah. you can you can perhaps with a decibel meter to try and get down to say 65 dB, that would be very difficult. That would be incredibly quiet playing. Yeah. But just the trying is so good. And then you do a crescendo, if you can get up to 110, 115, 120 dB, so a that can do that. Is with a good sound. That's the thing I was about to say. It doesn't measure whether the sound is good though. But so. but your ears measure measure that. You'd be surprised. But you know what's very interesting? That the harshest, most aggressive sound isn't the one that registers the most decibels. Okay. It's the one that's very beautiful and pure and strong mm -hmm. that registers a greater. Yeah, I feel there's more, yeah, I feel sad. Yeah. yeah. There's more energy yeah. in that sound. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then what's really interesting also about the decibel meter is to to check your, the evenness of your dynamics in the low, middle, and high register. Okay. Because it's very easy to sound quite strong and loud, say, in the upper register, but less so when you get onto the fourth valve register. <laughs> so if you can even those up, you know, bring that fourth valve register up and that middle register up, and what that does for you is it helps you feel what that means, when, what, what air you have to take, what air you have to give. It's very, very it's, useful. It's funny, I do all of what you're saying, but I do it in a little bit of a different way. <laughs> Nowadays you just click the computer record, it shows you everything, the way, the, the shape of the way. Sure. And then it's, uh, it's a little bit um, there's, easier. There's a sound recording machine over there with a with a wave on there, yeah. and it tells us if it's loud or soft. Yeah, we're, we're okay. You can do it like that. There's a, a number of ways you can do it, but yeah. for a 99, Sent app DB Meter Pro. It's quite useful, and, and when I'm working with students, I can 
say to them, okay, I'm going to take the, the, the phone with the decibel meter in it to the other side of the room because that's what really counts, is what it sounds like in the yeah, hall. The audience perspective. Yeah. You know, what, what are the audience hearing? Yeah. Because in a room, of, you know, you could sound fantastic, you could sound huge, but then you go onto a stage and it's, Ugh, thank you for playing. Yeah. And then you realize you need to take a breath every two bars. There you go. See? <laughs> and and it's, it's just getting to, to practice those things. And I do think that when I'm teaching, I like to set measurable goals. Something that the student can measure. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the number one rule I always tell people that I teach. It has to be progression based, based something that you can see on paper. Exactly. And that's something you can plan because that's a, um, I just had a student recently come to me from um, North Carolina because he wants to jump in into Duquesne graduate programs and. Um, he, uh, one thing I really picked off uh, his tonguing was uh, something I, in particular single tongue, it was a little bit fluffy. He has one of those super large things. You know, sometimes people can touch their nose with their neck. Yeah. He has one of those, and uh, but his tonguing was a little bit of uh, fluff, fluff rather than. So you recommended they had some of his tongue cut off? But no, 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 that's <laughs> <laughs> just um, a little bit. But no, 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 that's not what I recommended. But um, what I talked about is um, the exercise, and uh, I started asking him questions. And um, we started playing just a simple C major. And I asked him, what's your top speed, functional top speed, that you can sustain? He said they're around 100, 110. We discovered that he can kind of play like 100 and 110, but it's like none of it is like useful. It's all fluffy and it's still there, but we've kind of found that his actual crisp, good sounding thing is around 70. And I said, well, you need to start practicing that. And what I normally do if I want to focus on particular basic technique, I would pick the exercise, which is the most simple exercise where I don't need to worry about fingers, anything where I can just focus on the tongue. Skips. And um, asked him, so how many beats do you think um, would be a realistic goal to put on a month on your top speed, top functional speed, maybe he said. 10 beats, you know, it's like, uh, it sounds lot. like 120 beats a year, <laughs> so <laughs> 240 beats on your single tongue, two years, that's a lot, and that's a big thing most people don't realize, whenever they start practicing something and they see, like, um, they don't see those 10 beats a month, they're like, this is not working, but you need to, whenever I do these types of things, those progressions, you just need to stick with it, and it comes back to what you said, it's persistence, and, but most people get a little bit confused, because it's not working, it, it is working, you just don't realize how it's supposed to be working, that's, yeah. it's a big thing uh, I see uh, with university students, a lot, I see a lot of playing, not a lot of practice, I see them sitting in the room playing, but it's, it's different between nourishing the skills and obtaining skills. I feel that oftentimes when they come to university, a lot of students have obtained most of the skills. They can tongue, they can double tongue, they can triple tongue, they can slur, they can play high, they can play low. Now it's about making sure all of those skills at a very high level. And it seems like a lot of their practice is targeted towards obtaining the skills which they already obtained rather than going back and filling in the gaps which you know they missed out along them. That was a big thing because that's one of the things you told me when I uh, was playing because I often kept on asking you if I play a solo verse, um, what do you think? And you kept on telling me tongue, I think your tongue is a little bit you know, sloppy and that's something I, I worked on a lot and um, you kind of discovered that um, tongue, uh, fixing my tongue improved my flexibility a lot, which does not make any sense, but it, it does uh, make all the sense. <laughs> nowadays it makes a lot of sense because you're playing some of those arpeggios. If you miss time first one, you're probably splitting the first three and exactly. you're saying, so yeah. But what you said is really interesting, the, the huge difference between practice and playing or performance. Mm. And I think that many students and, and even many professionals don't really have a clear idea of what those two are. So uh, you'll get students who will play, let's say, a study by Blazevich, yeah. and they'll start at the top and they'll play down to the bottom. And they think that's practicing. Yeah. That's that's only playing. Yeah. Uh, and just explain to anybody who might be man enough to listen to this. Yeah. <laughs> If you play, if you simply play a piece, the techniques that 
are demanded of you are limited to those that are inside the piece. So the top note of the piece is the top note of the piece, the bottom note is the bottom note, the articulations are the articulations, the dynamics are the dynamics. But the musician should be going further than what's contained in a single piece. So practicing is where you enhance, improve, or attain a skill. Yeah. Uh, and you don't do that by rep- repetitious uh, Something you playing. already know, yeah. It seems yeah. like we're trying to learn the texture. Yeah. That's a big thing with pianos. If you if you look, even when Brute plays, if you look at the texture of the piano, just to learn the texture, now that's repetition because the texture is so commonly, but we play one line, and we normally know the texture in the back of our mm-hmm. hand, but, uh, but it's not the reason why we end up, you know, splitting or playing the wrong is nothing to do with the texture. It might have something to do with the breathing, might have something to do with articulation, and just, you know, overly repeating, 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 and never fixing. It seems like um, a lot of people have this uh, tendency whenever, even they have like a little moment in the piece uh, where they kind of, or a bar where they seem to never be mm-hmm. capable of, you know, learning, let's, let's say, complicated slur or whatever. And it seems to be there, they, they learn how to bluff through a thing. That's something I used to be really good at. And the bluffing. <laughs> I listened to some of the recordings, video recordings of when I was still living in UK, 2011, 12, of me playing some of the Carl Jenkins concertos, those kind of stuff, and it sounds really, really good, except for I know I was playing probably 60% of the right notes, and you're just playing random notes, and that's, uh, that's one of the things um, but I think uh, the lack of having a, a good teacher or having a teacher, that was my big problem. And I was always a very hard worker and never a very smart worker. And uh, that's one of the things that I used to always have an argument with my parents because um, there was no teachers around where I lived in. And uh, I kind of had to learn watching videos and I used to practice Arben and got to the point when I came to RNCM, I had the fingers like unlike anyone else for first year, but all of the other stuff. <laughs> was like really bad. It was probably the worst in the group. I had some, some, all the extended cool techniques I was really good at. All the simple stuff I was terrible. And I've never played in a band or brass band or any band. And I remember they first put me in a brass band and I didn't know how to follow a conductor and Nick Childs was conducting. Uh I was sitting and I couldn't understand what he was doing. So I was just kind of playing a note here and there, pretending that I'm working very hard. Good for you. <laughs> it took me a little while to get those things going on. <laughs> yeah, I think I think um, practicing uh, with smart goals, achievable, measurable goals. I think that's really important. And uh, so these days, I work um, when I'm teaching breathing exercises and teaching breathing. I have two machines that I use. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know one. One, <laughs> one of them is the Ultra Breathe. I use um, Ultra Breathe, which is um, it's an ult- uh, it's a resistance. It's a resistance. Like a mouthpiece you put yeah, in, you, you can can control the resistance. Yeah, you can control the resistance, and that, that helps people inhale deeply. And the other one is a, a Voldai spirometer that um, measures the vital capacity of the student. And uh, 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 what was that? Like, vital of what? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the, 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 the so called vital capacity of human beings. Is, okay, that's is the on my attention. <laughs> is the the amount in, measured in liters of air that they can take into their lungs, or that they are taking into so their like lungs? Like some sort of a bag, or no? A uh, Voltaire spirometer has a cylinder inside, and um, Never when you inhale, uh, you, the cylinder rises and it measures how much air you've you've inspired, you've taken in. Okay. Now. There's, there's a chart published by the American Thoracic Society, that's the, the lung doctors of America, that has average uh, capacities for males and females of different ages and different heights. So you can say to the student who's 20 and 6 feet tall, you should be able to, on average, take in 6 litres of air. Okay. Now, most people don't even get to the average unless they train. They know, it's not a functional breathing, is it? Because 
what do you use the oxygen for? Normally to sustain your physical activity. You know? Exactly. What's the biggest physical activity? You're jogging with people. Do? So some of them don't. Do so, some athletes would would, would work to their get capacity. <laughs> they, they would get very much closer. The swimmers, swimmers would get really uh, uh, probably close. Because they're used so to swimmers, using swimmers, divers, and divers, divers for divers, sure. They're yeah. used to using their lungs. So, so if you take a student uh, who's six feet tall and he's twenty-one years old, and he should be able to take in six liters of air, you can measure whether he's doing that. Mm-hmm. And if you measure it and it says you know, three point two, okay. then you know that yeah, that person. Uh, has to work crab breathing <laughs> you can give them yeah and, and, and you've proven it to the student you can yeah. say look you need to breathe a bit deeper you can say that a hundred times yeah. and the student believes you but as soon as the student sees yeah. has, me- has measured the amount that they can take in well then then it becomes a little bit more focused the work and uh, it's a simple thing to do I do that with all I'll be doing it with myself yeah. I believe you <laughs> because uh, you know as you get older the amount that you're able to take in diminishes. Why is that? Well, what what happens? Is the lung capacity shrinking, or what what happens with age? Because I I know that's a natural thing. The same with uh, a lot of people get facial muscle atrophy. I know that. Yeah. The, the the muscles, everyone's muscles, yeah. become less flexible with age. I mean, basically, you're dying from the age of twenty eight. Yeah, yeah. Most people, uh, most men. And so, uh, you know, the. the it, I approach that with uh, with the knowledge that it's going to happen. It's happening. So you need a, I need a strategy okay. that keeps me playing. So uh, I'm able to keep very flexible on the on the on the face through the exercises that I do on the horn and off the horn, yeah. on and off the horn. And and the thing that goes first is the breathing. So the breathing exercises uh, with an ultra breathe and with the Voldyne does two things. So I can train, I can measure, I can see how I'm doing, I can train again. Yeah. And um, I'm hoping that will keep me playing until I'm 100. That's a fair goal. Yeah. <laughs> You'll be the oldest, see, oldest um, brass, brass player, active brass player alive. Well, the record. Well, I had a, I have an, someone who inspires me, unfortunately he's passed away now, and that's Fred Mills who was in the Canadian brass, first trumpet for many, many years. And Fred and I used to go on uh, summer camps together, he with the trumpets and I with the the tubas. And he was in his middle to late 80s and still playing great on the trumpet. But his warm-up was incredible to watch because for the first few moments, minutes rather, nothing came out of the trumpet. Just air, just because nothing, because nothing, no sound, because his lips weren't vibrating at all. Oh really? And then after after about three, four minutes of keeping on trying, bah! I know it would come, and then from that it would get better and better, and then by in half an hour, forty minutes, he's playing great again. And so it's just that that start, that inflexibility at the start. Now that would kill quite a few players psychologically they say oh I can't play anymore I'm finished but it's that keep on going keep persevering well, I don't think it's necessarily the age person for, it, it takes me a while to get going I'm not a quick starter either uh, you, you probably you hear me e- each concert we, we have like I'm one of your earliest purple to, people to come in normally because I, I need to get that you know 20 30 minute warm up sure, you know like uh, Drew fell up and said okay I'm good to go <laughs> this is good for him everybody's you know? different yeah so it's not necessarily the age thing I think I think it, you know I I have this theory that uh, as I was growing up, I used to do this. I kid you not, I used to practice six, eight hours, and some of it was just to make sure I proved myself that I could do it. But I, I believe um, that some of it is because I, I did some stupid practicing when I was growing up. Like uh, eight hours of practicing is stupid. I used to have scars under my face and stuff like that. So I think the length of time is it's not that relevant. I think the efficiency of the time is... Yeah, but efficiency is based on how long you can concentrate. That's, sure, that's so six of those eight hours were probably wasted. Probably more like seven hours. Yeah, I'm, being, I'm being very honest, probably most of it was 
a waste of time because uh, somebody who claims that he's practicing eight hours then probably expect that. Um, I think I, th you know. I think it's for the student canteen. I think it's oh, I practiced eight hours today. Most stupid it's, thing, isn't it? Is, but you know, it I builds think up, it builds up a character. Right? That's one. It does that, and it also it also connects you to the instrument in a in a in a, in a very physical way. I think we all go through that kind of. Uh, desire to practice. My mother used to have to take the instrument away from me. Just you know, you find that's enough now. Take it away. I just, nobody, nobody told me ever to practice. Yes. Yeah, and that's something that is common to all successful musicians. That no one ever had to tell them to go and practice. I used to go practice skills and my parents pissed me off. Because <laughs> they hated it, but they would never tell me to stop practicing. So we need to wrap this up. So what's, what's, what's coming up? So what's uh, coming up uh, in terms of events for you, River okay. City? What well, do we have? River City Brass next so, month starts its uh, Night in Vienna series. Okay. And it's uh, Viennese music, of course. We have music by Johann Strauss, the elder and the younger. Okay. We have music by Franz Le Hard, who's going to feature your oh. good self in that beautiful song. The English title is You Are My Heart's Delight. Is that a new arrangement or is it some sort of a... No, I just wrote the euphonium part so far. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the arrangement, okay. the arrangement will come. Okay. Yeah, there will be. The arrangement will be there. Is it in the original key? It's in the original key. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's okay. in the original key. And uh, it's a beautiful song that comes from uh, a Lehar operetta called The Land of Smiles, which is one of my favorite, favorite operetta of all time. But we've also got some fun in there. We've got some umpa music or tuba fest. I'll be playing that in, oh, okay. mm -hmm. in Lederhosen. We've got 1812 Overture in that concert. We're not having a swing uh, series? We show? are, but that's not until May. I thought the next cycle isn't. Oh no no, it's April. What April. Am I saying? Yeah. We still got some concerts that left left with that Celtic connection. What, what are the dates for those? Next week uh, we have uh, Tuesday at Upper Saint Clair High okay. School. That's the thirteenth of March. Okay. The fifteenth of March, we're in Carnegie Music Hall in Oakland, and uh, it's a blast. That concert. Where, where, where can people get the tickets for that? Is it uh, all online? Uh? Yeah, you can get tickets at www.rivercitybrass.org. You can give us a call. Mm -hmm. and and 412-434-7222. Okay. See, I have all that information off by heart. Yeah, I know. You kind of had uh, to remind the audience that last concert probably like 20 times. Not the phone number, but uh, see. Well, you I sold do, it, though. But I do the, uh, I do the TV ads, so okay. uh, that's always in the script. For tickets, go online to Oh, 412-434-7222. There's sure to be a concert out of any near you. Well, that's going to be it, I guess. Hey, it was nice talking. Nice talking to you, too. And, uh, we should definitely do uh, do some more of these. Let's do it. Okay, uh, do you want to go and break down some of the questions that fans gave us? Sure. Okay, let's do that.